Okay, hello everybody. Uh, today I'm going to do a little talk at my daughter's ranch, which is Sandia. For those that live in South Texas, you all know where that is, kind of right outside of Mathis. But it's nice out here. I usually walk the area and, you know, it's a really nice spot. So I had no prepared plan to really come out to Sandia or I was going to maybe go to Kingsville or Bishop. So I thought the way I'll do it from now on whenever I visit these towns, if I prepare like a week ahead of time, it doesn't work good. So if I wake up in the morning and say, you know, today's the day I'm going to go visit people, I just text. So I texted David's son, little David, because I don't have big David's number, and I said I'm going to be making the rounds today. So I found that's going to be a little easier. It just so happened it was a rain rainstorm, but that's fine. Uh, so because of that, I figured I'm not sure if we'll speak, but then as I was making the ride, I thought, yeah, let me go ahead and talk about a few things. I Let me mention Roger. This is one of the notes that I wrote maybe three weeks ago, and this is like the stories I usually like to share. There's a friend of mine called Mexican Roger. Now, you'll see Mexican Roger on some of the videos that are titled Homeless Friends. <laughs> Mexican Roger I've known, you know, for... And the reason we say Mexican Roger, there was a white friend of ours named Roger Heiserman. Roger Heiserman died about four years ago. And he was well known where I live in Flower Bluff. And he was a friend of mine for many years and suffered from, you know, alcoholic, really bad Roger. But either way, Roger had died about four years ago. There was questions on the street. There's always rumors whether so-and-so killed him or these people beat him up. But either way, he passed away. So the way we would distinguish Roger Heisman from the other Roger was Mexican Roger. <laughs> now, Mexican Roger, if you ever saw him on the videos or on the street, he looked rough and he had long hair and he fit the part of somebody that was homeless but maybe scary looking. Now to me and to my friends, it didn't mean anything, but if you ever saw him on the streets of Corpus Christi, which he was on those streets for many years, you would maybe like be apprehensive. Well, when I met Roger, I don't know, 10 years ago, whatever, I knew right away he was a Christian. And Claire and others introduced me to Roger and sometimes he would come to Flower Bluff from in, in town of Corpus and the last time I saw Roger was maybe five months ago. And it was interesting because I remembered later that Roger, some of the older guys, their addiction was heroin. And heroin was the drug of addiction where I grew up as a kid in New Jersey. And my sister was on heroin for many years who passed away as well. And the last time I saw Roger, I was sitting under one of the bridges in Corpus and he knows me well and he'd always say hi brother John and uh, well actually that's the second last time I seen him. last time I seen him was at Walmart in Corpus Christi I was walking out of Walmart on Staple Street and Rod I heard somebody yell brother John hey Roger he said would you pray for me he said I just got beat up last night and somebody robbed my bike or tried to rob my bike and I could see he I, I'll pray for you Roger so I did pray for him but the time before that, I was under the turnaround bridge. And as we were talking, I showed him my sister's car, which I drive every now and then. And I told him, you know, Roger, I told him the story of my sister. I said, where I grew up, Roger, heroin was the big drug of choice here. It's a little different. I realized later that that was Roger's addiction. Some of the older guys from in town, that's their addiction. The ones where I live, a lot of it is meth or cocaine and Kingsville used to be cocaine. So it was interesting. I remember later uh, that must have stuck with Roger because I forgot that that was his drug that he struggled with. So I had a lot of good times with Roger. He's told me this story that stuck with me. Because I pray for the prisoners, and I made it a point to pray for the prisoners that are in the county jails and all these different places, Roger said, you know, Brother John, one time, out of the many times he was in jail, he said, one time, Brother John, he said, I was supposed to do whatever, six months or a few months, and I had a dream in jail. 
and he said in the dream, either someone had came to him in the dream, but God had showed him, you're getting out today. He said, you know, and when I woke up, I remembered that dream. And he said, they sure enough came. I believe, Roger, you know, there's no reason he had all. He said, that day they told him, you're leaving today, Roger. And he said, those things were interesting to him as well as to anybody. And this is what stuck with me, though. He said, I also dreamed that there was a black pastor and his wife, and they were in a hidden or secret room in the jail. And he dreamt this while he was in jail. And he said they were worshiping and praising and interceding, I guess, for all of us in prison. And then he said, when I woke up, I remembered that. Now, that stuck with me because when I pray for the prisoners, I will remember Roger's room. Uh, I just sort of like to remember, it says in Hebrews, remember those who are in bonds as bound with them. Okay? Remember those who are in jail as if you were in jail with them. If I'm going to speak, uh, hopefully I'm not talking too loud, I'm about 90% deaf right now for the last few weeks. That happens to me sometimes. So I need to be able to hear myself, but I can somewhat if I sound funny, okay? Uh, so Roger and the experiences with Roger were significant. Those things I remembered and praying for the prisoner in that dream. And so a few weeks ago, uh, my friend, who is Albert, and we say Mexican Albert because it was a white Albert, he told me, you know, Roger was the one who was killed about two weeks ago in Flower Bluff. There was a hit and run on uh, NAS Drive, one of the roads, and I remember hearing that they, everybody was asking me, oh, who got, whenever somebody gets killed on a bicycle where I live, so many of my friends are on bikes. So before the names are identified, we're always thinking, who was it? Was it Albert or a different one? Or, and it was Mexican Roger. And the bus driver who knew Roger told my other friend, he said, you know, Roger Mosier died. And so if you ever see Roger, you'll see him on the videos. That was his experience. Whether that hit and run will ever be investigated, that's some of the problems we do have in Corpus Christi when homeless people get killed on bikes, which happens a lot. Uh, oftentimes, those are not fully vetted like a regular death would be. So for some of my other friends who do watch us sometimes, Claire and Crow and everybody, uh, you might not have known that, but Mexican Roger is going to be with the Lord. So I wanted to remember to share that, and which I just did. Now... Uh, this morning when I posted whatever today, today's date would be, I posted a text post and I just caught the first verse of it real quick because I like to try and catch whatever verse I had on top. Happened to be Jesus saying that the queen of uh, the days of Noah and the days of Solomon, which is the, during the time of Solomon, it says the queen of Sheba, Jesus says, will rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because Sheba went to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and a greater than Solomon is here. Now, I can do a little bit on some of the folklore of King Solomon. That's what I was thinking about. Some of my friends are into some of the other. We have other things that are not in the realm of Christianity that interest so many people. And uh, you have the Kabbalah, the mystical literature of the Jewish people. You have books called The Lesser Keys and I believe The Greater Keys of Solomon. And these are things of interest in society. Now, I, I've read and studied just as a student a lot of the different writings and books and so forth. And I've noticed over the years some of my interactions with my friends like Austin, a.k.a. Trouble, he would read a lot of those, and he, he would bring them up to me, and I would tell my friend Austin, I said, Austin, I'm, I'm familiar with the writings, because as a student of history, I've studied them. And he would see I had those books in my library. And I said, yes, Austin, I, I read them only to learn, meaning if I'm going to teach 
Christianity and then sometimes we just cover religion in general, I said, that's why I read them. I said, but I'm not reading those books to look for other wisdom, meaning outside of Christ, outside of Christianity, though those wisdoms exist. And it's interesting because Austin sometimes would say, well, the way you have your yard set up with all the granite you placed and all, and you have all your incense, because he's seen them in my study, he'd visit me, and you have your candles, John, and he says, it, it, it's different the way you pray it. I said, well, I, I said, I just see those things in Scripture. When I developed my prayer yard, I happened to be reading the book of Ezekiel many years ago, and as I was laying out all my prayer area from the granite decks and so forth, it was kind of interesting, like prophetic, because as I was reading Ezekiel, it talked about the porches, the decks, the gates, and I said, wow, that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was more coming from Scripture than from any other type of source. So I just find that over time that people do find interest in a lot of interesting subjects that we can learn. And the Scripture that happened to be at the top of that post was the Queen of Sheba will rise up and condemn you guys in the day of Jesus because Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, recognized the wisdom of King Solomon and traveled to hear that wisdom. And Jesus says, I'm speaking of himself. The greater than Solomon is here. And if you did a quick review of some of the other uh, mystical writings and so forth, the things that even my friends Austin and others would tell me that they read about in different books it was all the techniques used and Solomon in the uh, Jewish wisdom literature uh, Kabbalah and things like that the mystical literature there was this belief that King Solomon had this particular ability to bind demons and evil spirits and he had developed the the myth goes he developed some of this understanding because of his relationship with all the different people that he he had many wives Solomon some say he had a child uh, even possibly through the Queen of Sheba I'm not positive on that but that Solomon had learned all these other things and techniques and so forth so in these writings it seems as if there's a history or a myth that Solomon had this special ability to bind evil spirits and it's interesting because there are all types of techniques that are used in some of these different writings, but the simplicity of Jesus saying that day in the verse we're quoting, a greater than Solomon is here, he bypassed all of those techniques. And then there would be people in his day that were demon-possessed, and he would uh, cast out the demon. Simply, meaning some of the other exorcists of the day, we read about some in the book of Acts, there were seven sons of a man named Sceva, and they realized uh, Paul and the apostles were casting out demons in Jesus' name. And these exorcists in the book of Acts, in the Bible, they also thought, oh, let's use the name of Jesus as a technique. And this account is in the New Testament. So these seven sons of Sceva, is, I think the name of these guys, they tried to use the name of Jesus, and they actually go to this demon-possessed person in the book of Acts, and say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And it's interesting because it says, the man in whom the demon was beat them up and jumped on them and assaulted them. And if I'm remembering the account correctly, the demon spoke from the guy and said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? So it's interesting, these Jewish exorcists in the book of Acts tried to uh, in, use the name of Jesus as the other practices that they were aware of and like sort of like, okay, let's use the name of Jesus. It might be another technique that we can use and add into our, if you will, ministry of exorcists. And the demon said, the man in whom the demon was spoke through the man and said, Jesus we know. And Paul we know. And that's interesting because they also knew Paul. And that's something because that's a, I guess that would be a good 
you know, on your resume that even the demons knew Paul. And at one time in the book of Acts, there was a, a fortune teller, and she was following the apostle Paul. And it says, as she was following Paul, and Paul was preaching the gospel, what was she saying? She was saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they show unto us the way of salvation. Now listen, this woman in the book of Acts was, if you will, a fortune teller, and she made her living in that way. So we're understanding from these accounts that all these things actually existed in the first century. They existed in the time of Christ, but Jesus and the followers of Christ were doing it different way, if you will, the greater than Solomon. They did not have to go through all these different techniques as well. They used the name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus to cast out demons. And at one point in the Gospels, we read that Jesus gave the followers authority to cast out demons, the other sick, the raise the dead. And so these disciples went out, and when they came back, we read in the Gospel that they were excited. And they said, to Jesus, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. And listen, listen to the response Jesus gives. Jesus says, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. So they were excited that they saw the demonic realm having to be obedient to the name of Jesus. And they said, we even cast out even the demons, Jesus, are subject unto us through your name. So that would be exciting, that this is the breaking through the kingdom of God. There was this understanding in the first century of demons. I gave you a little history of the Kabbalah and the thing of uh, Solomon. So in the Jewish mindset, they understood about demons, about demon possession and so forth. So the disciples are excited about that. <laughs> Like, wow, look at this. We can do it in the name of Jesus. They were not accessing all the other things available in that day to try to overcome evil spirits. But then Jesus reminds them. He said, look, I saw the chief of them cast down. Okay? So he witnessed the casting out of Satan or Lucifer. And he said, do not rejoice in that, but rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. So he founded them upon relationship. We are the children of God. We are the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. And we have authority through the name of Jesus. And it operated in the book of Acts as well as today in a much more simplistic way. That we have authority to cast out demons in Jesus' name. And we bind demons in Jesus' name. And it happens in Jesus' name. It's funny, I just sitting under the bridge yesterday, I saw Herbie. Those of you from the bluff, Herbie, you might be watching this. He's a friend of mine on Facebook. And he was bringing up some of this again yesterday. He said, you know, John, some people were telling me that we got to do a certain thing to cast out a demon or whatever. And Herbie said, and I told him, as Christians, we just do it in the name of Jesus. Herbie had told this to the other person. He said, you don't have to do all the other things. You just do it in the name of Jesus. And they obey. I said, you know, that's right, Herbie. I said, we do teach that. So uh, this short little talk, the greater than Solomon was Jesus. He had the greater wisdom. And there were people in the day of Solomon, and even in our day, who seek the wisdom, if you will, of Solomon. Some of the prominent books I already mentioned, some of it, some, uh, sometimes we refer to this as esoteric Christianity or mysticism and so forth. Now, it's a field of study and learning that is interesting. It's just point I'm making is we know as believers that we have authority through the name of Jesus and one of the rebukes that Jesus did give was why are you all looking to you know people did go out of the way for the wisdom of Solomon and Jesus said I'm right here I'm doing everything that you're seeking you know in the first century I'm doing all regardless of the reputation that King Solomon had and it does seem to in the literature it does seem that Solomon had developed particular techniques, and that's what interested a lot of people and does till this day. But we have the simplicity of the name of Jesus. We can uh, anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. We worship, we praise, we have this 
we are in this kingdom now that's a spiritual supernatural kingdom we heal the sick we raise the dead we cast out devils we do all we operate and function in all these things within the church and so i just you know that just kind of stuck with my mind and i'll mention this real quick because i looked at the top of the post what is today's date becky the 22nd uh, June 22nd mm -hmm. okay because I did look at the top of the post that I posted today uh, okay I'm almost done um, I read that verse the one I'm kind of quoting from I forget where it is but I did read it real quick and I noticed I must have been teaching Zechariah during that time I made those posts because I I said Kings 5 which was the text post. I have to remember that because then I posted on all the other mobile sites and everything else. And then I noticed I had Zechariah 5 and 6, like in parentheses. So I thought, oh, let me read Zechariah 5 real quick when I'm done before I come out and make this right. It's an interesting chapter. I won't do it all. I read it real quick right before I left. And uh, Zechariah has this vision. It's a prophetic book, obviously, like Daniel and Ezekiel. And in the vision, there's this flying, the King James Bible says, there's this flying roll, but it's a scroll, okay? The newer English versions say, Zechariah saw this flying scroll. So picture a scroll, which were, in the first century, you kind of didn't have the books like we understand, but you did have scrolls, and the Jewish, the Old Testament writings were uh, for the Jewish people were contained in scrolls and most of us know what a scroll looks like so Zechariah saw this thing flying and he didn't know what it was but it entered into every house of a thief of a murderer and so forth and it was a curse it says this scroll the interpretation is there in Zechariah 5 and it says this is the curse that goes forth in all the earth and it enters into the house of the thief the murderer so forth and it brings a judgment and a curse now uh, some teachers over the years I used to preach on KCTA radio wonderful Christian station still around today but I was familiar with the other preachers that were on that radio station that are still on and they're all wonderful people but I remember over the years some would say that what Zachariah was seeing was a UFO. Now, in our present time, I'm not going to sidetrack here, there's more stuff going on about government documents, newspapers, and so forth about UFO sightings and all that the government hid for many years. And believe it or not, you could say in the last six months, more has been revealed on that subject than the last 30 years because of various things in newspaper accounts and all. But Zachariah didn't see a UFO, okay? Some thought he was seeing a UFO. But he saw the law. The law of the Ten Commandments was what? Paul says in Galatians and Romans that the law is perfect and holy and just. God's commandments were just. But men were not able to save themselves by keeping the law. Paul says, if there was a law or a commandment given that could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But because there was no law given that could save men, Christ died. And Paul also says, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And just think of that for a minute. If there was a commandment given even by God that we could obey and that could save us, then why did Christ die for our sins? Well, the point was the law revealed the sinfulness of man to man. That's the purpose of the law. So what Zachariah saw, the scroll, that you would think, well, this is the law of God. This is God's word command but it entered into all the houses of the lawbreakers, and it was a curse. And Paul himself said, cursed is everyone that's under the law, because he cannot live up to the law. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
for he hath made him, God the Father hath made him, Jesus the Son, to be made sin for us, who knew no sin, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. So Zechariah saw that law and how that holy law of God actually did indeed bring the judgment upon men, not because the law was bad, but because men were sinful. And sinful men could not obey that law. And all it did was reveal the sin of men. And so that's kind of that vision he saw in Zechariah 5, but we are delivered from the law. There's so many verses on this, that being dead where hell we were, that we should be alive now unto God through Christ, to live unto righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. So when you're born of God, you accept Christ, you come into the kingdom, you're fulfilling the law. You're not out killing, stealing, murdering, doing all those things. Why? Because you're a child of God. He, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's about 25 minutes. So this, I don't know what we'll call this teaching in San Diego, but a good theme would be the greater than Solomon is here. I always like that. And in my prayer time, I'll use that as I pray for the wisdom of Jesus. That's what I'll ask in a certain point of my prayer time, who is the greater than Solomon. And so for all my friends who are wonderful people, remember that you can study some of that stuff, which is very interesting. And I myself am familiar with it. But the great wisdom of God, it actually says Christ is the wisdom of God. He's made unto us the wisdom of God. So we can bypass. I'm a type of person that I, I don't like to get hung up in all the bureaucracy, red tape, and things that you find not only in government, but you find them in religious institutions and so forth, meaning sometimes churches and Christians and all, they develop, well, if I'm going to do God's will. I got to go through all these procedures. There's certain things you got to be obedient to prayer and fasting, reading the Word of God. Those are some basic things that you should practice in your life. But sometimes there's a lot of red tape that Christians put upon themselves. They say, Oh, I, I, I got to no, it, the simplicity of the gospel is God has equipped us, He, uh, he authorized us to carry out the works of the kingdom. Jesus in the Great Commission says, as the Father had sent me, so send I you. Go into all the world and preach this good news to every creature. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Mark's account or one of the other accounts says, and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and they will not hurt them. They will drink any deadly thing and it will not kill them. And so we have a supernatural thing that we're involved in. And uh, we just proclaim that gospel today. All right, let me end in prayer. Oh, any questions, Becky or Lou? No. Did you all, did I talk too loud or because I can't hear myself too well today? No. Okay. No, so no good. questions at all. All right. Let me end the prayer. Father, I thank you for letting us teach in Sandia today uh, that on the greater than Solomon, who is Jesus himself. Pray that this message uh, would go forth also today. I'll be in this area, maybe Kingsville later, depending. So we pray a blessing on all this region all this a uh, lot further inland than I normally am when I'm speaking out of Corpus. So we pray for a blessing of God upon this region. In the name of Jesus, we do take authority of all this stuff, a lot of witchcraft and occult things, Father, we're aware of in these areas of South Texas. We take authority of those in the name of Jesus Christ. We set captives free. We pray that this gospel and this message would go forth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.